Hello, everyone. Um, so how's it? How's Hamburg? Great. How many of you took the boat ride yesterday? OK, not many. Yeah. It's a nice city. It's my first time being here in Hamburg and in Germany. So I'm going to be talking about uh, GitOps today and uh, taking a specific example of doing uh, Git push uh, workflows around Kubernetes. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, certain things like pipelines and GitOps and how are they different and some sort of things. So I'm Shahid. You can find me on Twitter. And uh, I work with a company called Hasura, where we build uh, tools around Kubernetes and stuff. And uh, yeah, our main thing is GraphQL and Postgres, where you get GraphQL APIs on any kind of Postgres database, existing or new, without even writing the GraphQL schema or resolvers. And you get authorization on top of it. So the Hasura platform as such is an operator on Kubernetes. And uh, how many of you attended Craig's talk yesterday on Kubernetes is a platform platform? Yeah, it's going to make much more sense because Craig has put the forward to it. So jumping right into it. Let's talk about Git, the second magical piece of software written by the legendary Linus Torvalds. And um, how many of you were there at my first talk today morning? OK, I'm going to be making the same statements again, so I hope it's not boring for you. So uh, a lot of people, uh, not a lot, almost all developers use Git. Is there anybody here who doesn't use Git? Something like Mercurial or Subversion? No, right? Yeah, even the big enterprises, even Microsoft has moved on to Git. Cool. So Git is the uh, primary part of my talk and primary part of GitOps. And the second part that I'm going to talk about is declarative tools. Uh, Kubernetes users, OK, quite a few. So this is primarily focused on Kubernetes, but you can apply the same principles elsewhere as well. So Kubernetes, uh, Terraform, or Ansible, or even, let's say, Chef, Puppet, um, CloudFormation, Amazon CloudFormation, all these are declarative tools which will let you describe the state of a system in certain configuration files, basically as text files. Now, when you have this kind of a power, when you have, when you have everything in text files, the next easiest thing or the next eventual thing that you're going to do is version control them. Version control them using Git. Now you get all the power of Git on your configuration. This includes uh, collaboration, um, if you're using something like uh, GitHub or a hosted Git service, you get pull request on your and on your configuration, and you get uh, immediate rollbacks, audit control, observability, and everything. So, declarative means a configuration is guaranteed by a set of facts instead of a set of instruction. So that means if instead of saying, "Hey, give me ten." Of the servers, you say, um, you say, you say there are ten of the servers instead of saying, "Hey, start ten of the servers and tell them when they are ready." So you don't say uh, how they are started or what is the order in which they are started. You only say this is the final state that I want, and that's the fundamental property of declarative tools, where you state facts, not operations. And uh, I know there are some tools which doesn't strictly fit into this criteria, but uh, it's OK to consider them as uh, declarative. Because there is always somebody who is taking care of these facts or this instruction and realizing them. So as I mentioned, declarative tools 
love to use Git as a source of truth. So the entire set of configuration is version controlled. Um, anybody can do code reviews, comments on the configuration, issues, pull requests, all these things uh, makes the system very discoverable and easy to use. For example, let's say you have your uh, organization's uh, build uh, or deploy system built on Git-based pipelines and stuff like that. Any new employee who, come in, who is coming in who wanted to edit a typo or even a collaborator who wanted to edit a typo on your website, it's very, very easy for them to just submit a pull request, see the changes get built live, and the owners can review the pull request and merge it and get it live. The user will not have to set up a build environment locally. They will not have to do the deployment process themselves. Everything is automated. Now, a very good thing about everything being declarative is that everything can be automated. Now, in case of Kubernetes, we use version control not only for um, uh, code, but also for the Kubernetes YAML manifests, so, so that you have a history of what evolution this app went through. Now, when you combine this with other declarative tools, as I mentioned earlier, you get this whole set of, uh, set of configuration right from your infrastructure to your application, its configuration, and its uh, source code in a single or maybe monorepo or multi-repo, it doesn't matter. You get all of them at a single point, version control through Git. So this opens up immense possibilities. And one of them is Git push. So as I was mentioning in my talk earlier, you can do Git push and do a lot of things. So this is, you can, you can uh, consider this equivalent to the way of creating pull requests and then doing certain action on top of these pull requests. So I just want to, uh, stress on this fact that when Heroku introduced the git push workflow, it was game changing. Usually you had to write some code, make sure everything is working locally, then you had to get a VM or a server somewhere, SSH into it, install all your dependencies, uh, make sure everything is fine, then copy over your source code, and then start the server. It, it was a process to get your code that is working on the server, on your local machine, to get it working on a server and expose it to the outside world. And Heroku changed the game entirely. It made you focus on your application, your source code, and everything else was taken care of. All you did was add a new remote, you did a git push. Now, this made everybody, every application developer, a ninja, right? They can do a lot of things that they couldn't earlier. So let's look at the simplest DevOps task. And that brings me a question. How many of you do DevOps or operations related tasks in your work, at your work? OK, quite a lot of you. And uh, how many of you are application developers where you develop the application? OK, cool. So this talk is going to be very useful to boast the crowd, where uh, we see how these two can play together and how the functionalities are different and how, how they can work. So I'm going to take an example here where uh, a simple DevOps task of building and deploying a Docker image on Kubernetes. So this is your usual step where you do these three steps. I had a demo of this earlier today morning, but I might show it again here. So you have this Docker build, Docker push, and then kubectl set image commands. So this is gonna, these are three commands, and depending on the size of the image, it's going to take a long time, a short time. It's completely up to, the, up to how big your image is. And this can be condensed into just one command, git push, right? So I'm going to show a demo, and uh, I'm going to go through, I'm not going to go through the live demo. Rather, I'm just going to play this video. So, yeah, basically you have some Kubernetes uh, ob objects on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there's an Nginx deployment running, and 
it is showing its a static image HTML file is deployed. Now, this is an example of what I was mentioning earlier, where you could have a simple typo on the page, and what you do is you can just make an edit, commit, and push, and get that change deployed. So you have a Docker file here, and you edit the source code, you make some changes, and then you can commit and do a git push. And it's going to build the Docker image and deploy everything. The developer is not doing anything. Everything is set up already automated, and it's just going to work. So yeah, once that is done, the change is rolled out, and you get the new content. So that's the idea. So this is, and you can do fancy things like checking out to a different commit, pushing it again to deploy it. So that was one fascinating thing that we did with Gitcube by applying the same principles onto a Kubernetes and Docker environment. OK, coming back. Any questions? OK. So now we thought about, hey, how, we can extend, how can we extend the same idea to other DevOps tasks? For example, um, building and running unit tests, deploying code, deploy configuration, stateful migrations. Migrations are always a pain, right? You'll have to modify the database schema and uh, run integration tests. So we have been thinking about all these things for quite some time. And uh, so this is another demo, which you can see uh, how we can extend this very easily by do using the same principles, but you can also do something like hack your, hack your own script. So this is where you can plug in your own stuff, where you can do stuff like send a Slack notification when the deployment is done. And the, something that I want to highlight here is that this is taking the Kubernetes secret from the cluster. So because your uh, pipelines or your steps to deploy are running on the cluster, you can make use of everything in the cluster. So this is an uh, example of sending a Slack notification. The token is taken from the cluster. And whenever you make the change and make a git push, the Slack uh, notification is also executed. So this comes up in your wherever your Slack channel is. So this is an example of uh, extending this uh, idea to other stuff as well. And uh, the idea is to make it configurable and easy for use to any, easy to be used by anybody without much knowledge of the system. For example, Kubernetes or Docker or anything. All you know is you can write script. You want some place to execute the script. So. So git push combined with Kubernetes uh, give us this power, right? To get to git push your Kubernetes manifest somewhere, and uh, everything will just start working magically. So, and with if you throw in some git git hooks magic also in the to the equation, it it looks very promising. So, but what's more awesome than git hooks or git push are Kubernetes controllers. So. This is the awesome thing about how Kubernetes work. You just give, tell Kubernetes, hey, this is what I want. And there are control loops running, which will look at this configuration that you just created, look at the existing configuration on the cluster, and continuously work towards driving the current state to the desired state. Now, this, there are certain con controllers built into Kubernetes, like pods, pod controller, replica, replication controller, deployments, uh, service objects and all. Now the real power comes when you have your own controller realizing your own application state. So this is what Craig was also mentioning yesterday. Complex applications are going to adopt this format. This is the future, where you have a controller and you define a CRD. Uh, the controllers are called operators on Kubernetes, Kubernetes operators. And the operator is going to watch on a CRD. To give you an example, 
let's say you have a database, for example, uh, or let's take a controller that is already existing, Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch has an operator. And what they expose via, by SERD is certain parameters that you can configure for the controller. You can configure what is your search index and stuff like that. And this control is going to make sure of actually creating the database and managing it. You, let's say you have five containers working together as an application. Instead of packaging it as a complex Helm chart, you can write a simple controller which will start and stop and update these containers as and when required. And you will only expose the variables that you have been exposing as template variables through a CRD. And with uh, new tools like Meta Controller and uh, there are new languages coming up, which is inherently meant to write controllers. It becomes very easier. Now, you combine these um, controllers, custom controllers, with Kubernetes controllers, you get all the power of Kubernetes. So the fundamental principle of Kubernetes from the beginning was eventual consistency, where you have something running on the cluster. And as I mentioned earlier, you Everything is declarative, and there are control loops on the server trying to realize this state. So if you look at the typical pipeline, and these are the equivalents that are drawn on a Kubernetes native or declarative context. You have a build and run unit tests. You can use Docker file for that. You have production artifacts. You can use multi-stage Docker files where your production image is different. Then you have uh, stateful tasks. You have CRDs and operators, integration tests, where you have uh, you run different set of init containers and uh, check if the microservices are ready. So this means you are not executing a pipeline as such. You are executing, you, you are stating some facts. And there are certain agents running on the cluster trying to execute some steps to realize these facts. So does that mean we don't need pipelines anymore? Uh, not really. I'll come to that. So this is where GitOps come in, comes into the picture. So I mentioned earlier we have everything declaratively configured. And you, have, you can use Terraform to configure your infrastructure. And entire system state is the version controlled. And there are tools which can check the current configuration Look, the look at the desired configuration, and everything is declaratively monitored also. And you can, if something goes wrong in your new deployment, you can git revert or git check out a different branch and deploy that branch. So the term itself is coined by VWorks, and they put in a, a couple of points where they def try to define what GitOps is. So, the first point is the code configuration and everything, the monitoring, the policy, everything is declarative. And it's version controlled through Git. Now, you can only automate and accelerate delivery of something if it, is, if it can be described and observed. Otherwise, it's not possible. So when you use Git as a source of truth, you can always take the current source of truth, observe the current state of the cluster, and compare it to make changes. Now, whenever you want to make a new release, let's say your image tag is committed to a Git repo. Your new release will be at the end of your pipeline. You make a pull request to this repo, where you update v1 to v2. And somebody, and, this, and your entire governance, human in pro loop governance pipeline, everything can come in this context. And whoever is approving the pull requests will will approve the deployment. So it gets deployed automatically. Now, this means all changes goes through the Git review process. You are not building a new image and kubectl set imaging that new image. It's all automated. So you can use custom Kubernetes controllers to realize the state. Flux from VWorks is such an operator which can watch a Git repo and make sure your current cluster is in sync with the Kubernetes manifest mentioned in this Git repo. So we try to extend this definition of GitOps, where GitOps is a way of doing DevOps, not a replacement to DevOps. 
So the inherent uh, idea is to commit the desired state in a Git repo where everything else is also defined. So this means that whenever your cluster goes down, you can directly bring up the cluster by applying the configuration in this repository. So this is going to make much more sense if you're more aware of uh, Kubernetes context. But the idea is, the, the main points that I would like to draw here is imperative and declarative DevOps. Imperative DevOps, pipelines by default are imperative, where you say step one is this, step two is this, step three is this, and you have certain steps defined. Now, GitOps by definition are declarative because you're defining the actual desired state of the system. But we might argue that, hey, you are having the steps in a YAML file. Isn't it declarative? No, because the actual state of the cluster is not declaratively defined. Only the steps to achieve that state is declaratively defined. So pipelines can become declarative DevOps if at the end of the pipeline, the last step is to commit these new artifacts into a Git repo. So now we look at the uh, differences or advantages and disadvantages of GitOps. Everything is declarative. Great. We know what the desired state is, but what about secrets? Like, what do we do with secrets? We can't commit them to Git repository. And what about certain variables that is dependent on the context where it is running? So these are a these are kind of challenges that the community is facing. And uh, there are a couple of solutions out there, like sealed secret, which will encrypt the secret variables, and only the agent running on the cluster can decrypt them. Now, we, as I mentioned earlier, it's very easy to recreate clusters. For example, VWorks had an outage, and they were able to bring, up, bring back their entire system within like 20 to 30 minutes. So, the, very, the next point that I want to stress here is there is a clear boundary between what a developer is doing and what an operator is doing. So I'll come to this point again. And uh, before that, we, the, one of the uh, hurdles that you have to pass is you need new tools like Kubernetes operators to achieve certain tasks that is introduced by certain ideas that is introduced by GitOps. In pipelines, you could write small bash scripts and get stuff done. But in GitOps, you need uh, operators or some kind of uh, new tools to get, get the work done. So the next point that I want to stress is Git as the developer and operator boundary. So where you have, what you have here is um, when you are interfacing with Git, as I mentioned earlier, your operators decide the plumbing underneath. Whether it is deployed onto Kubernetes or a Mesos or DCOS and wherever, it, it doesn't affect the developer finally. All the developer is going to interact is with Git and what is there in the Git repository. And this saves a lot of overhead in which developers need not be aware of what the actual infrastructure it is deployed. In some cases, they have to, but generally, Developers don't need to set up the infrastructure themselves. Everything is taken care of by the operators. So Git is, we, we envision Git as this stable surface at which developers and operators are separated. Now, this means uh, we are not restricting anybody's ability, but we are, we are restricting what, we are not restricting developers to carry on with their tasks. We are not restricting operators to carry on with their tasks. And everything above the Git layer stays consistent. And operators can choose to change and do whatever they want with the layer underneath. So there are some constraints here. So one of the constraints is uh, they can only provide ideas to or provide automation to stuff that can be described in declarative files. So this means everything should be code. Everything should be expressed as code. And everything is code with Kubernetes. So we have already passed that hurdle. 
So what we achieved here is we have a reduced tool set for developers. All developers do is interact with Git. And we have complete extensibility, where operators can do whatever they want underneath the Git layer. So that brings me to uh, pipelines. We still don't have tools that does everything declaratively, which pipelines can do. There are a lot of things that uh, GitLab Auto DevOps or Jenkins X and tools like this can do, but we don't have that kind of flexibility when we come to the declarative tools. And unless we have them, pipelines are here to stay. They're not going to go anywhere. And continuous work is being done in the community to achieve all the things that are possible through pipelines, through GitOps also, or through declarative tools also. And this is not considering the human in loop governance uh, for code review or anything else. So just the idea of sequence tasks, that's what pipeline is. And GitLab and uh, Jenkins X tried to achieve uh, this Git as a boundary through pipelines. And uh, GitOps is just another way of doing this. So pipelines can become GitOps if they, at the, at the end of the step, they start committing the artifacts into a Git repository, like the image tag into the Kubernetes deployment file. But uh, it's not uh, right away GitOps enabled. So there are some tools out there which does parts of GitOps. For example, GitQ, which I demoed earlier today, takes your uh, source code and the Docker file and then realize it on the cluster and Kubernetes manifests. Now, you might think that this is also a pipeline, but it's a custom resource combined with your Git repo realizing certain things on the Kubernetes cluster. And that is the Kubernetes native way of doing things. Now, there is Flux from VWorks, which is the second one, which will take a Git repo with Kubernetes manifests in it and continuously try to move the state of your cluster to that state described in the Git repo. And then there is Hasura, where you have uh, a lot of things on top of GitOps. Uh, for example, Hasura is an operator running on the Kubernetes cluster, which can apply database migrations on your Postgres database, which can do subdomain changes, which can do new domain additions, all sort of things. So it, it makes use of Git hooks and operator pattern. So yeah, that's my talk. I think I have uh, 10, 12 more minutes. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Yes, please. Uh, thanks for for the talk. Um, I have one uh, concern or one one question that is that I often like to like do something, get push, close my laptop, and go home. Um, the pipeline that I have um, in my daily work um, they ta often take quite a while to finish. So I wonder how this would uh, work in, in, this, um, in this context. You do a good push, and then um, you need to wait uh, until everything finishes, right? So can you just, like, in this state, what, does it, uh, what, what, um, what happens if you just uh, close your laptop lid and uh, break in the middle? Uh, this is some, some concern which I like yes. at a async um, architecture, like you push something to GitLab, GitLab runs a pipeline even if you are long gone and uh, yes. you look at it in the morning. So this, this is what he mentioned is I make a git push and then I have to wait for some things to happen, right? But if he pushes to GitLab and the pipeline gets triggered and it's, it's a asynchronous task. So this is the question of synchronous versus asynchronous. So what I have mentioned is an idea of how you can use Git to achieve these tasks. One example is to have this synchronous loop in which you get immediate feedback in the Git push itself. And it's all up to the user who is implementing them. For example, if you want immediate feedback, you should be setting up a synchronous workflow. 
But if you don't want immediate feedback and you would like to wait for a pull request based approach, you can implement that. The exact same thing can be done in a pull request also. So one way to do this is to have separate remotes to do separate things. For example, if you're working on a dev machine and you want immediate pushes to happen, you have a separate remote called dev. When you, do the, when you push to this dev remote, you get immediate feedback. And when you push to an origin remote, like GitLab or anything, that will give you an asynchronous feedback later. So this is all configurable and extensible. It's, a, it's just an idea that I'm drawing it out there. And uh, yeah, you can make use of multiple remotes in the same repository to achieve these kind of tasks, where you want synchronous now, but you don't want synchronous then. Like you want to suddenly get push and leave. So you might push to a different remote. So it's up to what the use case is. You, if you want immediate feedback, you use a synchronous uh, task to achieve it. Does that answer the question? OK. Other questions? OK, so I would like to, uh, I, I might show couple of other demos, if you have no other questions, because I still have some time. Um, so what I'm going to show here is, as I mentioned earlier, you can achieve more using this uh, idea of Git to do to separate operator and um, developer boundaries. For example, as a developer, you might not have control over uh, the subdomain your application is deployed on. And uh, I'm going to show an example in which the developer itself can edit the subdomain. OK, not this one. I think it's this one. Yeah, so basically, let's say you have an application deployed at www. And, uh, when you have a configuration change, a configuration like this, which says the subdomain is www, and if you can declaratively define this, then you, any change to it can be uh, committed and pushed. And with making use of controllers and hooks, this configuration can be uh, realized. So it will be available in the subdomain. So these are the kind of things that you can apply. And uh, the next one is database migration. Again, when you can have your SQL files and YAML files uh, de defined somewhere, uh, you can easily make sure that these migrations can also be applied. So there's only one table now, and then we add some migrations, and we can git commit and git push these files to get these migrations on the cluster. So now the easiest thing to do here is when you have a staging server set up, it's very easy to just set up a new remote and push to that uh, remote for production cluster. So now you can see all the new tables are created. And there, you can also, there are some data also inserted. So that's it. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, I will be around if you have more questions about GitOps or anything. Kubernetes Docker as such. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah.